Warlord's Ruin, it's the new dungeon, let's talk about it. I really loved the setting. I know the phrase Elden Ring and Dark Souls came up several times during multiple runs. I had a great time exploring these areas. It's also the kind of area that I don't really feel like we've seen in a while, like Rise of Iron, Iron Temple, so it was nice to kind of revisit that. I loved all the exploration and platforming sections, all the bait chests with the screeves killing you, the maze with the traps. That's always good for a first time experience. Even some of the names of bosses felt souls inspired. The music also felt very souls inspired. Sure, we're used to, you know, run down post golden age settings, but this had more of a medieval vibe to it that we don't normally get to see. I know that the underwater sections of Ghosts of the Deep were, let's say, divisive. And I think that a lot of people did prefer this style of platforming and traversal over something like Ghosts of the Deep. I love that there were three bosses as opposed to two bosses and a non-boss encounter. It just makes the experience feel more full as a whole. And again, is not something we historically see. Spire of the Watcher had a glorified platforming section as an encounter. That being said, the first boss is a complete pushover on normal mode, and it took a while for me to even understand the main totem mechanic, which is stand in the circle with the totem until the totem kind of expands or like blows up or whatever. Normally, these totems are things that you want to kill instantly. Like that's how we've been programmed as Destiny players over the years, kill the totem instantly. And I didn't feel like I was really getting the feedback that I wanted to be getting when I was doing the right thing. It took a little bit for it to kick in and sometimes you're not looking or you're trying to dodge the boss or the enemies. So you kind of like step in for a second. You're like, oh, nothing's happening and you get out. So maybe, I don't know, I just need to be more patient, but I, I would have liked a little bit clearer or maybe faster feedback on that whole thing, that what I was doing was working. I know there's an audio cue as well, but it didn't really kick in right away. Dumping people into the jail cell was pretty cool. I like how it's actually better to help each other than it is to try to look for all of the eyes that you need to free yourself. Pro tip, if you're struggling to find all the eyes that you need to kill. Otherwise, I like the encounter as a starter encounter, as a mechanic teaching encounter. But in a team, it's a complete pushover. There is not a lot of meat on this guy at all. Going to jail ended up being the hardest part of the whole run for my team. And I think most other teams as well, based on what I've seen. It took a while to figure out what those dashes on the floor meant. But I, you know, I love me a puzzle. Fortunately, this is one that can be solved near instantly going into the future. So you're not going to have to spend a whole lot of time redoing it when you already know what to do. The second encounter doesn't really feel like a pushover, which is nice. We still have the totem mechanic, but now we've added in the warmth mechanic where you need to stay near fire during the cold storm and you need to light fires to keep warm from the cold during the damage phase. And you also use those fires as DPS plates, for lack of a better term. Very callous esque hopping from plate to plate, original Leviathan. I mean, I guess it literally is the callous DPS plate situation. You just need to build the plates yourself first. I enjoyed this encounter a lot more than the first because there was actually something going on. A lot more movement, a lot more to pay attention to, and perfect execution felt a lot better to perform here. Once you got the fight down and you really had a lock on the mechanics, you could start getting all of the orbs you needed to start a damage phase in one cycle, reducing the duration of a fight, which is a great feeling. Enemies are around enough that they're probably not gonna be why you wipe, but they can cause an untimely death if you're not paying attention. However, this fight has an issue that the final boss fight has as well, in I guess addition to the first boss, which I will talk about shortly. The final boss fight swaps out the warmth mechanic for a game of tag with corrupted hex drinkers, where you need to trade the debuff that you get during the fight to this enemy by meleeing them, while also avoiding them so that they don't tag you back, a concept 
that I thought was pretty neat and can make for some funny but occasionally frustrating moments. I also thought clearing the floor of blights was a nice touch to make sure you're actually paying attention to your surroundings. The progression of the encounter to the top was also pretty fun. It keeps things moving quite a lot and has the potential to open up new damage strategies since you're doing many short damage phases as opposed to one super long phase. Believe it or not, my team tried out snipers. You know, all those snipers that we've been stockpiling in our vaults. We finally busted them out, Whisper of the Worm specifically, and eh, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. Is it the best choice? You know, potentially, if you could hit your crits, not run out of ammo. But if you wanted to run rockets or linear fusions, Le Leviathan's Breath, you're gonna be fine there too. All of it's fine. One thing that I thought was cool was during the top floor damage phases. The eyes that spawn next to the boss are susceptible to AoE damage. So teams that can properly utilize AoE damage into their damage rotations can get rewarded with longer periods of time on each platform to do damage. It's not mandatory that you interact with the eyes at all, but if you get creative with these strategies, you get rewarded for those strategies, which is awesome. That's a really nice touch. Now, Elitus Datto is gonna step in here for a moment and talk about something that I personally thought was a little bit of a negative. I never really felt any tension or pressure during the dungeon. I realized that in basically all other dungeons, there are rarely time limits on bosses or phases. There are no enrages or anything like that. But after duality, even after Spire of the Watcher, final boss, after Ghost of the Deep, I missed that pressure. I missed the feeling that if something did go wrong, that things could get a little scary. Like the first boss, we barely understood the totem mechanic, crushed the boss super fast. Second encounter at least had the stay warm mechanic to figure out, and there were a couple of times where people died, but I never felt like the run was dead pretty much at any point after we figured it out. The final boss, we didn't even wipe. We were just able to figure it out along the way, and it never felt like we were in any serious danger. There was never really tension. There were no penalties for messing anything up. The game was just like, ah, all right, just try it again, keep going. So any pressure that there could have been about messing up a mechanic or something getting harder because you failed to do something else or someone dying just never existed. Sure, Ghost of the Deep didn't have any failure mechanics either, but the combat intensity kept things tense the whole time and Ghosts and Duality have more punishing timers. You got a minute long timer for Galron damage. You got damage windows for Kaitol. Those are pretty short. Those are a couple of examples. A bad damage phase on the final boss in Ghosts, Samuma, was brutal. Messing up a mechanic was a big time loss. Duality messing up a damage phase on Kaitol was a big deal. Galron also kind of a big deal. Here, if something got messed up, it never really felt like I got punished for it, so the stakes didn't feel as high. Also, the things that did have a timer weren't really that punishing. Like, if you failed a game of tag on the final boss, it had no impact on the rest of the fight. You just get picked up and you move on. Missing a totem was a bit more punishing, but the damage windows were generous enough that it never really hindered you that badly. Master Dungeon is a thing, I guess, if I really want tension, but I got that tension in Duality and in Ghosts, and even the final boss of Spire of the Watcher. This is probably an out of touch moment for me though. I don't know how much people actually struggled in this place, but I'm gonna guess it wasn't as much as the previous dungeon. I also realized that something as punishing as messing up a Keitel damage phase is not exactly popular among the entire player base. I think most people would prefer only losing 30 to 60 seconds of work versus losing multiple minutes if something goes wrong. This is a pretty specifically me opinion, which I know the bulk of you 
are going to disagree with, probably, and that's okay. Don't worry about it too much. I'm not trying to get Bungie to amp things up just for me when I know how well received this place is as it stands now. So, just, I know I'm in the minority on that one, all right? Let's, easy, easy. All right, back to regular Datto. Uh, Loot-wise, I have not been hearing great things. The Rocket Sidearm seems pretty cool. I don't know how good it actually is in PvE yet, as I've only gotten a couple of them, and they both had kind of bad rolls. But the weapon archetype itself seems neat. Otherwise, we have a Strand Sniper, a Strand Bow, and a Strand Sword. This place seems like it's just trying to fill out some slots that we don't have filled out in the game just yet, like a Strand Sniper, like a Strand Bow, like a Caster Frame Strand Sword. But the perk rolls don't really seem to be super enticing, or at least don't appear to be anything that will break into the mainstream. The origin trait is also just, like, why? This is not a combat vehicle heavy game. No one's using vehicle perks. I know, like, certain enemies are technically classified as vehicles, but, like, just, uh. Although, anything with a slice perk on it is something that I'll be watching, because I think that perk has some potential. The armor isn't too bad at all. I don't know if it's on the same level as the Taken King armor from Ghost of the Deep, because that was just insane. But it ain't too bad. I don't have the exotic just yet. It is also a rocket sidearm, which I've been hearing interesting things about in PvP, but I don't really have a verdict on them in PvE just yet, other than they seem kind of neat. So let's talk about the solo experience now. If you thought that this was going to be any easier than something like Ghost of the Deep, you are the slightest bit right, although it is very close. I have soloed the dungeon on my Hunter because I heard it was the hardest on Hunter and I just wanted to check it out. After messing around on my Titan and first trying both the first and second boss, I swapped to my Hunter. And it's a bit of a different ball game, although it is completely doable. I'm working on my solo guide right now for all the classes, and while I typically avoid seasonal artifact perks in order to make the guide relevant as long as it can be relevant, I'll also be talking about setups that take advantage of Season of the Wishes artifact perks, since the season still has, uh, let me check the time here, um, probably about another 180 days in it. Solo Operative is here this season, which means if there is a time to solo a dungeon, it's probably this season. The first boss, much like in a three stack, is a total pushover. But I think that's okay because it makes for a good warm up for what's to come. There are no super long phases like the second or third bosses. It's just enough to get your feet wet and familiar with the experience. The second boss wasn't as bad as I was anticipating, but will still require a few cycles of damage to take the boss down. Fortunately, the pre-DPS phases aren't too long, so even if you had a bad phase, you can get back to it pretty quickly. None of these Keitel or Samuma boss damage phases where you're running back and forth like a maniac for 10 minutes before you get to a phase. The final boss did surprise me, and that is because of the relentlessness of the experience. The Scions basically don't stop spawning if you kill them non-stop. You gotta try to leave a couple alive. Otherwise, it's just chaos the whole time. Plus, you got those Blights on the ground. Plus, you got Wizards spawning in. Also, you're gonna want a ton of healing. This dungeon is scaled and built to the point where Bungie basically assumes that you are running some kind of healing-based build and that the healing you will get will be at a near constant rate. This is the only way that apparently they can challenge people who are running solo dungeons. I don't know what that says about the state of the game, or the state of the solo experience, or maybe the state of build crafting. There's probably some commentary in there for another day. But if you're trying to do this without any healing, you're going to have a really tough time. Something that worried me was seeing the damage I was doing to the final boss and just feeling bad about these tiny little bits of damage I was doing as I transitioned to the next area, but those feelings subsided after I completed a full damage cycle because the boss was almost at half HP. You'll probably go through two cycles, maybe two and a half, three, before you start hitting final stand. So try to think of the boss experience as 
how many cycles do I need to get through versus how much damage do I need to do? And you'll probably feel a little better about it. Unless your damage is just really, really, really poor. Very interested to see if any new builds pop up for the solo dungeon or if it's just going to continue to be the same stuff. I'm guessing it's the same stuff, again, because of healing. I haven't really seen people deviate too much so far, so I guess we'll see. Time-wise, duration-wise, how long did it take, Dado? How long did it take to kill the boss? The final boss took me about 25 minutes with some seasonal perks thrown in, which is half the time that Samuma took on a good run. I don't remember what my time was on the second boss. It wasn't too bad either, somewhere in the 20 minute range. So while the solo experience still has around the same intensity level as Ghost of the Deep, it's not gonna take you nearly as long to complete these boss fights, which I think is to everyone's benefit. I didn't like that the final boss fight took 50 minutes in Ghosts. Once you do a couple of cycles, that's good enough to say that you know how to do it and making it last even longer just doesn't really do the game or the experience any favors. All in all, very fun dungeon experience first time through. I think a lot of people are liking the bosses, the mechanics, the setting has been getting the most amount of praise. Boss health is quite manageable, but it's also aided by the fact that damage phases don't take terribly long to get to at all, which is a massive change of pace from duality and Ghosts of the Deep. Spire of the Watcher didn't have super long pre-damage phases either in a group, but I think people just forget that Spire exists in the first place because the only high praise that it got was its final boss. Pretty darn solid dungeon experience. Still a tough solo, which I like, so I think people have quite a lot to be happy about. A little boost to the loot would be nice. I think that's really about it. Let me know how you're feeling about the dungeon in the comments. Interested to hear this feedback. Uh, like on the vid would be pretty cool too. If you could do that, that'd be sweet. Uh, that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.